Mike Chard, who is the director of the City and County of Boulder's Office of Emergency Management. He's also one of our co-hosts with us here today um, with the City of Boulder. And we've had a pleasure of working with Mike quite a bit over the last year and a half on a number of different projects. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Mike. Great. Thanks. All right, thanks, Rebecca. Good morning. Remember, she said hydrate with water, okay? Just to let you know. All right, well, kind of responsibility keynote is to not really maybe educate you, but try to inspire you. So that's my goal today is try to inspire a little bit, lead off, get some energy going. Everyone's feeling pretty good, stoked, right? Early in the morning, we're caffeinated. Everyone's feeling stoked? Everyone's feeling stoked? Yeah. There you go. That's what I like to see. Got to have some energy here. So why do you think I'm opening with a tomato? Well, if you remember, the title of my, my talk is about smart to wise. And what this means is knowing a tomato is a fruit, right? That's being smart. Being wise is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. It's a joke there. All right, don't worry about it. <laughs> Not a good one. So, uh, anyways, we're going to share some of the. We've had a, you know a lot of smart and wise uh, things, and some of our wisdoms comes from our mistakes. Uh, but really, what I want to start talking about is a story, a journey of our organization, and how we went from basically nothing when we started out in 2009. I had an EOP that was you know just completed, but it was done with. Uh, you know, a contractor, so it was good, but wasn't great, perhaps. We also had just completed a flood exercise before I arrived there, and when I took over my job, I worked for a board, the police chief, fire chief, and sheriff. And the sheriff goes, well, Mike, do you want the job? You have uh, no authority but the responsibility for everything. I was like, cool, that's great, I can work with that. Because if you don't have authority, what's the number one way you get things done? Any ideas? What's that? So, someone said something. Bribery. Bribery. Okay. <laughs> Let's come, you know, it's not East Coast. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. No, it's called influence. You have to influence people because you can't tell people. And let's be honest. I was in the, you know, first responder for 27 years, and we have a real bad habit of talking with four fingers, right? It's like, I need you to move that vehicle right over there. Do you read me? And people are like, whoa, what's with the four fingers? Calm down. So, you know, in emergency management, we're like, well, hey, how you doing? So it's more open-palmed. So influence is important, but having a good team, that's where it started. So I had this AAR that had all these problems. I just had, you know, an EOC space. It wasn't a hot EOC, so it was one of those things where everything was in the cupboards. It took three hours to set up. Of course, our disasters really get up and ramped up in an hour here. So by the time you set it up, it's already a problem. You're behind the power curve, create some problems. So we had, a lot of, we had some good stuff. But more importantly, I had a Mac group, and I had a good team. So this is where you all kind of start, take inventory. What's the involvement of the people in your community with your emergency management enterprise? That's the foundation of what will carry you through the darkest and hardest times you'll experience when a disaster hits your community. Without them, you're done, all right? The strength of community. And then your immediate team. When we have disasters, we've had a few here in Boulder, we don't get to sleep a lot. We do like 40 hours straight. Kind of, it's not a cool thing to do. But the problem we've got is we don't have a lot of depth because we're a surge organization. You know, with the, with the law enforcement fire side, it's like you do your 12 hour shift, you get an eight hour rest period. That's not how we work. Because there's so much special, unique training. And if you're starting out, it's like who else knows how to do it? So you start learning the value of expanding out and sharing knowledge and information, engaging more people that can do your job, get some redundancy. So you can have more capacity. And that's what we started learning. So I'm going to kind of share this story. But a great team. This is the original team we had. Didn't realize my head was still that kind of forehead back then. So anyways, that's the way it goes. But after that, so your community, your team, then it, the next step was culture. So when I got there, it was like, I really got to start building the right culture because everything else will be lost if I don't have that. So the culture became these three icons with my team. They had to adopt it, they had to live it, and they had to understand it because then they're gonna work with our multi-agency coordination system and start sharing it and fostering it. So if you look up here, the red flag stands for? Switzerland. 
Neutrality, awesome. We can't be politicized, we can't have a side. We're gonna be the brokers, the bringing people together. Now some people that know me, see a lot of faces in the crowd, like, he can be polarizing sometimes. Remember, Switzerland also has what? Chocolate. An army. <laughs> chocolate too. So bring the army together, have some chocolate, you don't need the army, okay? So sometimes you do have to defend yourself, all right? But we begin with neutrality, not aggression. The second piece was Disneyland. And the reason why that was there is you want the land of possibilities. You know, you go to Disneyland, overpriced trinkets, long lines, you know, you spend a lot of money, but everyone does what? They want to come back with the next generation. Not everybody, but most people do. And why is that? Yes! So let's be happy, let's bring joy and fun into this. Let's create a great experience so people want to come back to the EOC. Because most people end up getting what kind of assignment at the EOC? The disaster hits, you missed a meeting, guess what happens? Someone goes, you need to get the EOC because they're calling for help. You're like, I've never been there, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So down you go, and these people walk in the door, adrenalized, fight, flight, freeze. Our job is to get them out of that. Get, it, get the dopamine and serotonin roll in. Hi, how you doing? A friendly face, reassurance. It's gonna be okay. I don't know what to do. Can you use a phone? Yeah. Can you write things down on a notepad? Yeah. You're gonna do awesome, come on in. They're like, what? There's all these computers and technology, it's freaking me out. You'll be fine, we'll get you there. We're gonna be here a couple weeks. <laughs> Just in time training goes a long way. And the last one was the mothership. I want everything connected to our EOC. I don't want people thinking they can survive without us. So we're gonna just finger off into many parts of the community. Public sector, nonprofit sector, the communities, government, all that, get it connected. That was our culture, so that's where we started. Next thing was meeting people where they are. Where do most people begin? Especially when emergency manager, you walk through the door for emergency managers in the room, you know what I'm talking about, right? You walk in there, you go, hi, I'm with emergency management. I want to get you to do a training exercise cycle, maybe help write a plan, commit like, you know, hundreds of hours of your valuable time, limited funds. They're like, no, no, no. <laughs> Everything begins with no. So I teach my staff, how do we go and learn some mediation and negotiation tactics? How do we move from no to yes? What does everybody have time for? Any guesses? Free lunch, <laughs> right? So if you're no, 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 I'll say, can you give me a half hour at lunch? I'm buying. You name the place. Oh, I'm getting hooked. Yes, you are, because we're going to start there. What is success? What is failure? This is how you got to change your mindset. Some people are all in. Success is any percent that's away from zero. If that's one, three, 25, 100, all, I don't care. Give me what you can, I'll work with that because it's an investment over time. And eventually at compound interest, it will become the most powerful force in your community because 5% turns into 25% over five years. And we're 25% ahead of where we were if we didn't do anything, all right? Gets things rolling, you just might pick up some momentum. So, meet people where they are, get them through that. A little bit of Sigmund Freud here for don't know that, right? Wherever the, the ego goes, the it shall follow sort of thing, you know, so a lot of times. I, I work, my, my wife is a therapist. I, I had to marry her because the co-pays were killing me. And uh, <laughs> so I get to learn a little bit here. So uh, change is the next piece. So you got the culture set up, you're meeting people, you're engaging them, you're getting them to go. And here's sort of the extreme as kids, right? As babies, we have similar behavior patterns as adults. Some people will say adults act like babies, but I'm not going to comment on that. But this is a range of where people are on change, isn't it? Screaming, no, resisting, aggressive, bewildered, or just, I love change, <laughs> okay? So realize you're gonna find a whole emotional response beyond this. Behind the yes and the no, there's an emotional component to being a human being. And trying to understand that and work with it is gonna help you engage these community members that are so vital to your overall success. And then lastly, the trust meter, right? I have three things I teach my staff on trust, right? One is be truthful and transparent, two, you gotta follow through. Three, you gotta spend the time. Why do you spend the time? It's not that, you know, it's spending time for spending time. You're spending time so that you become predictable. People wanna know how you're gonna react in that EOC when things go bad. Are you a yeller screamer in the face? Or are you a person that protects and flares out and says, I'll take the hit, that's my role. 
I am a rawhide chew toy for my community. <laughs> if there's a policy group person or someone that's angry, my job is to get them out of that environment, the EOC, pull them aside, let them be human, get it out of their way. I don't react to it. I just realize here's where you are. So yell at me, don't yell at them. And then when they get done, I say, you done? You good? What can we do? Part of that, people watch. That stuff becomes a big part of your trust. So those are three levels I teach my staff they gotta be working on when we're building that trust. Because without this, it doesn't matter. You won't get any implementation going. A lot of people are about to hit the dartboard. Gotta be bullseyes. How many people in here are C students? Okay, thank you for being honest. <laughs> Welcome. Okay, we know where all the A students go. They go into GIS. <laughs> all the C students go into emergency management, <laughs> okay? So that's how it works. So part of this is shifting the culture away from this dartboard world and getting into this 70-30 piece, right? We have a saying and you'll, in, in Boulder, you'll see it a lot. They'll say 7-0 and go is charge mantra. Let's get it good and go. A boat has a bilge pump for what reason? Because it's not watertight. As long as we're pumping out more water than what's coming in, what does the boat do? Stays afloat. That's how you gotta look at what you're doing. We can get so caught up in being perfect that we yet delay implementation. And when you got things in a disaster, you can't do that. You won't have all the capabilities built ahead of time. All right, you'll be doing things on the fly. And we call that contingency planning. We have a mantra around here which calls crisis management is done by 911, that's incident command. The EOC is a coordination management support and contingency center or consequence management. We are the place where you go when everything else I just don't know where to get it. I don't know, I don't have a capability for it. You come to our center. And then we have to develop things on the fly. And if you're looking for perfection during a disaster, you'll never achieve it. So you gotta get that thing built and float the boat and patch the holes when they start coming through. So it's a mind shift, can you do that? Two groups that have a hard time with this initially started implementing and engaging them was one, the PIOs, because how are they brought into their world? What's the culture of a PIO world? All information must be accurate and vetted. Who else sounds like that? It's like, you know, it's us, GISers, we're the other group that like to be perfect or vetted accurate information. Getting into the mode of saying, just push it out. Get it out there, create bandwidth competition for all the people that are out there posting all kinds of crazy stuff because social media gets cranked up. I love social media, by the way. I use, it, I use the heck out of it. But you gotta get in the world, you gotta start competing. And if you're worrying about this last 30%, you're late to the dance, all right? So you gotta push it out and get comfortable with it. This is the most accurate and current information we have at this time, stay tuned for more. And you'll build in to accuracy, but you're gonna start out with just being involved and engaged. Two different sort of mindsets. Meat and potatoes. Ooh, that looks pretty good, doesn't it? A little big chunk of meatloaf. Got some, yeah, then you get an angioplasty right after that, feels pretty good. I feel like I gotta pop a nitro just looking at it. All right, so define your meat and potatoes. So we've got culture built, we've got trust built, we've met some people, we've engaged them, we've got them thinking, you know, different mindset, you don't have to be perfect, just 70, 30, 7, 0, and go. You got them going, now we gotta figure about what are we trying to get done? The human side's out, now it's the business side. What are our processes and our policies? You gotta know what it is, so you gotta get some meat and potatoes defined. By that, we went down and we said, what does our EOC do? So I use this and it can be debatable, and I get it, I'm a debatable kind of guy. I argue with myself sometimes, but for incident command, it's life safety, incident stabilization, property conservation. That's, the, that's what you do. For an EOC, these are mine. This is what we do. I don't have a process, I don't have a mission that doesn't fit crisp EOC. That's what we call it, we want a crisp EOC. I like that funny little acronym there, right? So our whole design and everything feeds into this mission set. That's the meat and potatoes. So feeling pretty good about myself. Now I need some structure. So here's our EOC structure. You'll notice we've got a lot of ESFs because we're bolder, we're different, <laughs> okay? 15 in the national response framework, we're up to like 30, hope to be by 50 by Christmas. Um, anyways, you'll see we have uh, some GIS folks in here under our situational awareness section. So they get in there and they'll, ESF 26. We use ESFs when we have multiple jurisdictions or organizations that need to be brought under a unified planning center or point. So when you see, a GI, when you see an ESF, that means there's uh, government, nonprofit, private sector people that are part of that. 
and then we hold ESF planning meetings to help them build capabilities and plug them into our EOC. And you'll see a whole mess of stuff there. I can explain this later. Uh, just a little side note on Boulder, we like think we're different. You know what the best part about living in Boulder is? We're only 25 minutes from Colorado. It's really pretty nice. It's not a short drive, you just, you're there. Um, Scott, you've already heard it, I know. It's just, you've been around a couple of talks. And then after we get our processes going, because now we know what our meat and potatoes are, and we now start to figure out our processes around this, we've got to figure out what's our variance tolerance. So what this means is what's bad and what's good. It's your goalpost. Many times you write SOPs and policies with no thinking about what is the process going to be and what's the range of acceptable performance or behavior. So we start defining this upper and lower tolerance limits of that. And then we start to go to work once you get a framework of that is figuring out, all right, what's the bell curve of people that are going to be working there. And this is what I've kind of seen in the EOC over time. You walk up, you got it, like, oh yeah, I got it. Like, oh, we're good, we're good, uh-huh. So being able to detect when people aren't even in the variance goalposts is important. But once you kind of figure that out, then we start doing a lot of lean work. So we'll start doing a lot of sticky notes. So people know we call them flow charts over in Boulder now instead of flow charts, but it's process mapping. And it's, uh, give me a whiteboard and some sticky notes, we can change the world. That's how you can do it, it's that easy. But we look at every process, and we've done plans, we've built capabilities, we figured everything out. If there's something we do in our EOC, it has a process map attached to it because it's great for making job aids. And the reason why it's better than policy or procedure manuals is it takes into account decision points. Decision points are where people make mistakes or don't have the expertise or the experience to know what to do when they come to that fork in the road. This gives them sort of the guardrails or handholds of how they can get through it. You're probably going, how's this deal with technology yet? Don't worry, we get there. All right, and then this is a finished product of a flowchart that we have. It looks kind of complex, but actually, it's not all that bad. And this one here is the incident management process of how we escalate our community from a type five to a type four and up into a type three environment, because we were struggling with the type four environment. We were, we, we were so much work on the initial response, mutual aid, and then getting to a type three. We have type three team, we have the EOC, but that, that mishy part between there, 3.5 we call it, how do, you, how do you get through that? So we process mapped it. It's made, and then we did a full scale exercise around this. Worked really well. Um, and then you gotta game it. So after every time we develop a process, we bring in people that, from our Mac group that we know would be around this. And we, we put them out in a point where they have to make decisions or they have to figure it out. We explain very much what they have to do. And it's about can they do the process from start to beginning, like a game board. You have artifacts, you have rules, and you have a goal, which is to get to here and you win. And we try to test that. And if we game it and it survives it, then we know we've got something and it's worthwhile to start taking it out there and looking at technology solutions that we have to it. And we use WebEOC as one of our big uh, technologies for how we do a lot of things in our EOC from uh, situational awareness to resource mobilization to, and this is how we keep track of it. So we just print this up. What used to take us weeks to reconcile after disaster. Our two biggest disasters took me 30 minutes to go ahead and print out our financial report and send it off. And we had really good accuracy around our ability to reconcile resources we called and attach them to somebody for billing. Big change. We also then have our shelters up here. Okay, maybe. So we've got uh, shelters that we can load in there. We also have all of our facility emergency plans and continuity of operation plans. So just a lot of things we also will then use Everbridge for notifications, some social media and apps to help us get along. And then of course, Esri and other GIS stuff that quite frankly is beyond me because that's where the magic happens in a little room there where, where you guys do all your crazy GIS stuff. Uh, and then after we, if it games it, we look at the technology solution, we find that, then we start doing about the training exercise. Let's get people trained up on this stuff because we know we got a solid product. We're gonna, you know, no one likes to attach to a mess, right? How many people want to take this invitation? Hi, come on down to the EOC. We've got a pro we, we have something we want you to do. We have no idea what it is. We have nothing to help you do it. We, have, we don't know really sure if the technology works. And it's going to be really probably confusing and probably stressful. Who's coming to join you? Yes. Versus hearing, look, we've got a good process. We've used some subject matter experts out of your discipline. This thing seems to have some form to it. We have some job aids. We definitely have got some curriculum to teach you. Come on down, we'd like to teach you how to become efficient, help out in our EOC. People are like, okay, that sounds good. Let me try that out, more likely at least. So really the equation that we used in our EOC was one, predictable human behavior, hearts and minds. You gotta win them both, right? It's how people feel and what they think that matters. Wherever they are, we meet them there, okay? Next, you gotta get good business rules and policy down. This is gauging your policy group, 
making sure they know what you're doing ahead of time, and they're giving you, many times you don't need money. Many times you don't even need equipment. What you need is permission. My God, we got so much done just getting permission from our board. I need the EOC to go from a training to an actual hot EOC, and here's why. And they go, do it. Permission to change the use of a multi-use room. Foundational to our ability. We have to have our EOC up and going in one hour from the time that we're notified. Okay? And if we're in the shop, we can be up and going in 10 minutes. And then lastly, sorry, Marshall, I'm out of frame. I did it. Got to happen once. What are the business, the technology pieces? Human behavior, process, policies, and technology. Those are the three things that come to success. If you can get those together, you're great. I've been around government for a long time, for some more years, all right? And I've seen us always go to technology first. And three years later, where are we? This technology stinks. We're right back in the cycle of trying to find another technology to solve the people problem or the process problem. You got to get these two done and then do the technology to be successful all the time, all right? 70% of the time. Okay, and then the output of all that, then we, you know, we get plans and we get job aids and we get all this capability built and it's memorialized and we're great. And then of course you spend all this time getting this done. You're like, whew, success, right? And the minute you turn your back on this stuff, what happens to it? Entropy. That which you put form to will start to become frayed and dissolve into mass chaos. <laughs> so you're constantly trying to build something new over here. You're constantly here trying to keep things engaged in the present so you can get to over there. And then you gotta worry about what you did in the past so it doesn't just all fray and fall apart. So you're like, you know, you know, spinning the plates. And you think you got the world by the hand, you know, it's, oh, it's my world. I have it. And then it happens. All right, so for us, we didn't have all this stuff done picture perfect on Labor Day of September 10th, or uh, 2010. We had a four-mile fire. At, the time, it, it, at that time, it was the single worst wildfire in Colorado history. 169 homes, 6,100 acres. We went through all that in 14 hours. Wind-driven fire, start at 10 in the afternoon. By the morning the next day, we were at 60 or 5,800 acres. Uh, it's just cranking away. I had my EOC had structure, I had some MAC group engaged, and I had some process done. Not a lot. I was only there since June of 2009. So guess what we got handed to us on that day? We got our butts handed to us. Underdeveloped process, not a wide capability, not all capabilities. So we were doing a lot of stuff on the fly, and it was one of the wildest experiences of my life. Our EOC was activated for five straight days, 24-hour uh, cycle. Uh, recovery started shortly thereafter. <coughs> and uh, we were in recovery right up until August of 2013. Important date to remember, right? But what we did was we did a lot of after-action reports. We kept people engaged. It was hard on folks, but we were able to hold them tight, hold them close. Let them know that we're going to fix the things we're having problems with, and people were able to endure it. It's amazing how your partners will hang with you, just as long as they know you're addressing it. You're not throwing people out. We didn't blame anyone. All right? I, my staff and I, me as a director, we took all the hits. If something failed, it wasn't because of you, it was because of us. We just didn't have it done. I tell the power saying, look, I'm sorry that happened. We own it. I'll fix it. And people are like, okay, cool. <laughs> all right. So we were able to keep people engaged for this and get through right after action, and more importantly, the improvement. One thing that we did here, though, was we had a little bit of breaking the cycle in our county. Our county had this really bad habit of we would do these larger scale emergencies and we have fail points, and there'd be no beyond that. So we're constantly going to a point and then going back, doing our after actions and our improvement plans, and kind of getting in the cycle, but the improvement plans really wouldn't get much fixed, so guess what we wouldn't do? We really would get to the next level. But because we had some front end work done that wasn't there before, we were able to climb that mountain a little bit. So we had some successes as opposed to all failures and a lot of bad energy and motions. Anyone been around those? Calls don't go well, people are angry. In the community, a lot of places, they start turning in on each other and grinding, and that's when you know you got problems. Okay? But we were able to get a little bit further up so that we could kind of see a little more. Oh, we need to go that direction. But then we really wanted to follow through heavily on the improvement plan, which was strongly supported by our policy group. They force people, get in there, 
and get, you know, you need to be involved. It helped me. I didn't so much have people, meet, I didn't have to meet people as much where they were. They had to kind of meet me where I was now because of the value was there. Because that was incredibly, wow. Two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. A bit dramatic, I get it. But, you know, it's, it's a little better than saying, well, I really don't know why you're here. It's just GIS stuff, <laughs> right? No, see, that's, what you do as a GIS pers- professional is profoundly important. First responders usually get the center point, especially in 911 calls, appropriately, right? When you have a disaster, it goes beyond them. When a disaster hits, you have people in your community that are heroes because they're not going to get an on one call. They're on their own. It's neighbor helping neighbor. And then you become a hero because you're bringing a very important capability to a disaster. And this is where you have to see and you have to be you know, motivated. And, it's, power, and it's, it's powerful for me. I love my GIS team. My GIS team saves our rear a lot in a lot of ways. Okay, And this is what it's all about. So if you don't know why, here's why you're doing it. Okay, there's maps that are coming up. What's the power of a map? Just don't use one in a disaster. You'll find out what I'm talking about. Being able to look and see, watching human beings at a community meeting and having a map to show them what's up, what's down, takes away the horrific state of not knowing. Suspension of grief or stress, we call it suffering. JS people have a tremendous impact in driving that down. Sheriff Pelly here, great boss to work for. We have community meetings. People are coming to these things. They want information. They want to see information. The PIOs rely on you to get that information out. So it has a public information communication piece to it. The resources we need. If we can get a size of a fire, it gives us the ability to kind of see what's there. If you can geolocate those resources, you have more safety for first responders. It helps you also lean forward because what you do profoundly affects situational awareness and the ability to know what's happening, more importantly, predict and forecast trends. This is sort of what we came up with in our experience of how things go between recovery and response. And you'll see all these things have to be done if you want to run a disaster well. You better have a capability for each and every one of those things. You better expect these surges. Otherwise, you'll be caught and surprised. GIS helps us map this, understand it. Situational awareness, like I said, is profoundly important. It's one of my critical missions. Without it, we're dead in the water. GIS helps us gain it, maintain it, and develop it. Policy group loves to have current information. Our GIS staff takes what's simply a wall map and our EOC, which by the way, just getting this is important, right? We like to call it the 1983 plan. For those of us that are old enough to remember the day where we had a pager as our means in a three-channel radio and pads of paper, we ran disasters that way, right? It's not on, you know, smartphones. Technology fails, you better have a 1983 plan. We just did our 1983 plan in our EOC in October. It was a coronal mass ejection from the sun that took out everything and how do we do everything the old school way. But this is still GIS, right? Up above there is our GIS Chipotle menu because what we have is all these ESFs and people want a map or people want information. So instead of creating a line, we we need a better process. So GIS came back with a process of here's how we want it done. They got a cool form, they got everyone understands it, you got job aids to help you figure out how to request it. It goes very efficiently, very smoothly. People are getting maps very, very fast. So we have right there, there's a little testament to GIS. Over on the right, you'll see our gong in the EOC. So we have have a gong for it, I'll explain why we have that here in a bit. On top of that, our GIS team takes that map and then turns it into this kind of stuff. This is our next gen. This is working with NAPSIG here recently. We just held a tabletop uh, citywide with all our policy group. And just being able to take this situational map, take all the data that's in there, draw out polygons, and pull up information about residences, vulnerable populations, road closure potentials, the number of people that are evacuating, gets me to do what? Lean forward. Back in the older days, when I started out, the ICS interface, the EOC ICS interface is such, like, you know, the 1990s called, they want their interface back. If you're an EOC and you're waiting on your your incident commanders to call you with information, you're, you're missing valuable information, which is what? Social media. 
Data mine the heck out of that. Another topic. But being able to take that information then and plug it into a viewer and then start translating that into information profoundly can increase your situational awareness immediately, whereas you're not waiting three hours for the incident commander to kind of figure, okay, great, I got some time to talk to the EOC. All right, damage assessment. Another place GIS plays a profound impact is we have a, a damage assessment uh, plan team and our GIS folks take that data, they'll heat map it, they'll be able to geo-reference uh, everything that's going on. We have a portable you know, uh, smartphone devices that come in, download it, go to the GIS layers, they then bring that up and boom, there it is, you can see impacts. So if I can get situational awareness and I can determine impacts, I can determine capabilities and where we're going with this incident, and how we need to handle it. All that was built for the 2013 flood. And then the worst day happened. We wrapped up recovery on the fire. We had like two weeks of like, woohoo, we're done with the recovery and bam, here comes the flood. We got 17 inches of rain in four days. We basically have an annual rainfall here of 14 inches. Uh, basically the entire county was covered. I had one road open. Deep canyon flooding, uh, just pockets, the upslope came in and just kept ringing out along the front range and Boulder was the center point of that whole flood. Uh, we had four deaths, 10 in the overall, but everything that we've been working for from that fire, had we not had that fire, which created a burn scar, which also then made us change the way we monitor weather and the way we react to it, made us razor sharp. We were on this, when the first drop of rain hit at two o'clock that afternoon, we were already starting to track it. And we moved with the disaster. We didn't wait for it to kick our butt a little bit and then shift and try to figure out how, what the impacts are. And the bottom line on this, to close it up, is sort of Darwin. It's not the strongest or the smartest that survive. It's what? The most adaptive of the species that will survive. So don't be a dinosaur, be a sparrow in the snow, as we're here in Boulder in the snow. Enjoy it, you Floridians. You will survive, but adapt to your environment, adapt with your policy group, adapt with your community, and you will be able to find your successes. And lastly, Speaking of culture, we have a gong in our EOC. This is some simple things. You ever been in a loud room? You can't hear, you can't sell the room down. We do, call, we do sit briefings pretty quickly. And I watch people. So if you go, you know, you do the whistle or you scream, what do people do that are kind of shocked by it? Like, what is your problem? It gets them adrenalized. Something as simple as this can just take the tone down. So we, we get ready, the room's buzzing. We'll have that EOC going like crazy. I'll go, SAS, we need to call the room, get a sit briefing done. They'll get up there and go. And you'll watch 150 people stop talking, settle down, and we'll have a conversation that fast. It's just something about it. So Rebecca wanted, and Paul wanted me to bring this so they can use it with you. <laughs> so during the conference, if you hear, pay attention. Thank you for your time. Look forward to seeing you all. Have a great conference.